I, uh, my background in terms of uh, working in schools started as a youth worker, uh, working across a cluster of schools uh, on the Mornington Peninsula. And I was just continually both inspired and frustrated by what I saw happening in schools and in communities. And I started to see that there's a whole lot of uh, different groups, different stakeholder groups that all care very deeply about outcomes for young people. But at this point in time, there wasn't a lot that was bringing the community together. And there wasn't a lot about sharing resources and doing things differently. I was incredibly frustrated that every idea or suggestion that I had about a program or a new initiative that we might be able to start, the standard excuse, and I'm sure you've all heard it many times before, is that it's a great idea, but we have no money. And consistently, that became the excuse for not doing good things. And I guess I felt there were two things really wrong with that. The first one is that a lot of good ideas cost nothing. If we're open to thinking about things differently and being open. Uh, the second thing is that there is actually money available. You may or may not know that there's over 5,000 registered trusts and foundations in Australia and about 40% of them give a substantial amount of their income that's distributed every year to education. There's at least half a billion dollars a year invested from the corporate world and from the philanthropic world in education. And what really concerns me is that this goes into areas that are fueled with good intention but not always what you or I would feel is the area where we can have the greatest impact. So what a lot of my work is about is how do we bring people that work in schools and have first-hand, direct, lived experience of what the needs of young people today are, how do we bring that group together with all of the resources that exist in really surprising parts of the community? Uh, really surprising parts of, of um, industry and the workforce that want to be seen to be doing something that's uh, you know, socially responsible but don't necessarily know how to do it. And I guess that first point is that while I'll advocate really strongly that we need to work together and be willing to do things differently, the first thing to say is that there's actually a lot more enablers around us than you might imagine. There's actually a lot more access to resource and people and good ideas. Uh, so I really just want to reinforce the point that it's not something you need to do alone. I'll show a short video that was put together um, by the heads of all of the major, I guess, they, they call themselves the national architecture uh, of education, of, of school education uh, in Australia. So you've got groups like AITSL, the Institute of Teaching and School Leadership, looking at national standards for teachers and school leaders, ACARA, looking at the national curriculum, um, Education Services Australia. So this was put together by them to say, what does 21st century learning look like uh, in the world today? We wanted to talk about 21st century education. We are living through an educational revolution. The pace of change is staggering. Schools, regions, entire countries are turning education on its head and redefining the experiences of students and of teachers. The impact is felt by millions of children and their families around the world. Let's consider for a moment the world in which they live. A world with so much knowledge it's hard to grasp. People are creating 2,000 new websites every hour. They are uploading 35 hours of video every minute and watching 2 billion YouTube videos every day. By the time they leave school, teenagers average nearly 1,000 Facebook friends. They connect with people thousands of miles away as if they were in the same room. They consume, produce and communicate information in previously unimaginable ways. They truly are the children of a globalised world. And where are they heading as they grow up? To a hyper-connected world with more people and fewer resources. A busy and competitive world full of uncertainties. A workforce that is more mobile and better qualified than ever before. And careers that span multiple jobs, positions and skill sets, some of which haven't been invented yet. In response, Education leaders are making big changes, building 21st century skills, using enabling technologies and personalising learning to engage students in diverse and creative ways. 
In South Korea, schools are switching to digital textbooks so students can study anytime and anywhere with online hours recognized as school attendance. In Denmark, students are using the internet while taking exams. They can access any site they like, even Facebook, as long as they don't message each other or use email. In the USA, ultra-personalized learning approaches allow students to create their own individual schedules. Their interests and performance are logged daily to generate playlists of learning options, with teachers' time freed up to mentor and supervise students. Learning can happen anywhere and everywhere. That's why some Australian schools are pushing learning beyond school walls where internships with local organisations are a fundamental part of each student's learning plan. Distance learning programs are connecting seriously disengaged students with online learning communities and personal mentors to help them rediscover their love for learning. The opportunities for 21st century education are immense. These examples point the way to ensuring that tomorrow's workers, parents and citizens are more creative problem solvers better communicators and lifelong learners. To make sure that change happens on a massive scale, we need to make big changes. That's why we've designed the new Australian curriculum online, supported by interactive, constantly updated digital resources, structured around students' and teachers' needs. And it's why we now have national professional standards for teachers and principals that make sure they meet the needs of 21st century learners. But that's just the beginning. Join us as we broaden this debate and connect educational pioneers and thought leaders across Australia and the world. In terms of jobs and, and uh, a lot of the thinking at the moment is very much around we need to not just prepare young people to apply for jobs but we need to prepare young people to create jobs. Um, and I think that's a re if we think about career education and what that means, I think that's a fundamental shift that it's not just about mapping out a structured pathway that exists today, but doing that as well as uh, having a, a whole new generation of young people that are actually very equipped uh, and, and entrepreneurially minded, if that's a word, um, you know, to actually be seeing opportunities and developing uh, you know, new jobs that don't exist now. I think similar to Australia, if you look hard enough, you can find pockets of amazing things that are happening in schools anywhere. Uh, now, the use of technology in a couple of states that have, that have uh, you know, like their playlist type concept there, um, there's examples like that that are, are terrific in some schools in America. It's hard to generalise in Australia, but what I would say is that some of the best collaboration and innovation and use of technology that, that I've seen happening here is usually happening in spite of the system that we're in and not because of it. Uh, and, it and it's no sort of secret formula that you don't already know. I mean, we're talking about good people that are willing to have a go and do something differently. Um, two weeks ago, I ran a, uh, a rural youth ambassadors program for year 11 students from many of the state's most rural and isolated schools. Uh, and the most common, uh, I guess, reflection that they had about technology is they actually don't need any more devices or uh, platforms than what exists now or what's in their school. Um, they said well, every time there's been a grant available, every time there's been an opportunity available, uh, you know, for technology or for access to devices, their school gets it. They said the problem is we don't have one teacher that knows how to use it. Um, and so it's all there and they're like, well, our teachers don't know how to use it and, we, and they won't let us teach them. Um, so the technology piece is actually a really interesting one because we can't just assume that it doesn't exist and we can't assume that it's not there at our fingertips, but how we actually use it in a way that uh, means we need to stop being fearful. And I guess the, the natural starting point with technology is we want to protect um, you know, young people from something we don't always know. Uh, but I think there is so much fear around online existence and the online profile that young people are building. My personal view is we need to be teaching them to be proud of the portfolio that they're creating, um, rather than just banning everything that a lot of schools do. So 
to answer your question very simply, I don't think we should look just to America, the Australian context. I think there are excellent examples, often enabled by um, corporate partners as well, like Microsoft and their partners in learning program that are actually trialing really good things. I know Telstra do quite a bit of work in education, um, as do Apple. But on mass, I don't know that we're really anywhere near the point that we should be at in terms of how we use technology.